Maryland men's basketball is finding its groove at just the right time. The women's team has their season hanging in the balance, and both wrestling and gymnastics struggled over the weekend. We'll break down all the action and more coming up on 2024's first edition of The Left Bench. I just think everyone's really locked in on what we're doing. I think they understand what we have to do to win. Uh, especially with a lot of the missed free throws we had and, and layups, I thought we dug ourselves in a, a really big hole. Welcome back to the desk. For the first time in 2024, it's the left bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Jonas Evans, Nathan Schwartz with me. As always, Nate, boy, is it good to be back. Yeah, it feels so good to be back on campus doing the shows. It's been so long, it feels like. It's been almost two months since we've been with you guys, but we're not the only ones back. Jonas, I think Maryland men's basketball might be back. Yeah, for the Terps, consistency has been a big issue, but they sure have found a rhythm uh, as of the last few weeks. Yeah, that, this momentum that they've got going, it carried right into Saturday's performance against Nebraska. Maryland men's basketball may be trending in the right direction. With a win against Iowa last week, the Terps made a statement at home against Nebraska on Saturday. This one's starting ugly as the Cornhuskers jumped out to an early 12-2 lead. But Kevin Willard and company gets a spark in a place that has struggled all season, the bench. Jahari Long and Jamie Kaiser Jr. check into the game and light up Nebraska from beyond the arc. The two combined for 25 points, 21 of them from three. Defensively, Maryland forces 18, yes, 18 turnovers, capitalizing in the fast break. The Terps were on point all day long across the board en route to the 73-51 to thwomping against Nebraska. Here's head coach Kevin Willard with more on the improvement from his squad. Um, I just think everyone's really locked in on what we're doing. I think they understand what we have to do to win. Um, they've bought into it. And... You know, we're just, we're just not having as many breakdowns, to be honest with you. It's just as simple as that. The past week has been the best yet for Maryland Hoops, but it hasn't been all sunshine and rainbows for the Terps. TSC's Ryan Martin joins us in Studio B to take a look at some of the early struggles of Maryland men's basketball and some potential bright spots. Ryan? That's right, guys. Allow me to play devil's advocate, as Maryland men's basketball has seemed to open the eyes of its critics over the last two games against Iowa and Nebraska. But as mentioned... It's been inconsistencies that have plagued the Terps early this season. One struggle doomed Maryland last season and has transitioned over to this year almost seamlessly. The Terps cannot close out games. Maryland went 0-4 in one-possession games to start last season, a trend that finally changed when the Terps snuck out a 67-65 win over West Virginia in the first round of last year's NCAA tournament. But to start the season's campaign, Maryland has fallen back into the bad habit, going 0-5 in one-score games. Now, the Terps are up to 1-5 in, in those narrow games, thanks to Jameer Young's game winner in Iowa City last Wednesday. But was that just one good finish from a serious All-American candidate, or can Maryland finally be trusted in close games? Matchups on the horizon could be a great indicator of that. Speaking of Jameer Young, he's been better than advertised in his second season as a Terp, but Maryland has struggled mightily at finding consistent scoring options aside from its homegrown, homegrown point guard. Young has carried Maryland to a 500 record over its last eight outings, averaging almost 22 points per game, the highest contributing player to a Big Ten team's point total during that span. As Maryland looks to turn its season around, Willard must keep getting creative to, offensively to support Young. And with recent flashes from Dante Scott and Juju Reese, they just may be the answer. The two upperclassmen have found easier scoring opportunities as of late, and that's been huge in a season where two talented freshmen have taken longer to acclimate themselves than many expected. Jamie Kaiser Jr. and Deshaun Harris-Smith have had disappointing debuts this season compared to some serious preseason hype. Both DMV natives were expected to fill in the backcourt scoring production after Hakeem Hart and Ian Martinez transferred last summer. But the new faces are still settling into a Maryland team, averaging the lowest points per game in the Big Ten this year. Neither Kaiser nor Harris-Smith can say that their top three scorers for Maryland this season and neither freshman boasts a field goal or three-point percentage that ranks within the top four for Maryland this year. As part of Maryland's two-game winning streak, Kaiser recently had a career-high 14 points against Nebraska, and Jahari Long has come off the bench as a solid scoring option. Both con contributions will be much needed as Maryland tries adding to its resume. The defense has been consistent as the best in the Big Ten, but 
after early struggles, some slight improvement in offense may see Maryland grab some huge wins in the future. Back to you guys. A lot of things to take away there. First of all, Ian Martinez leaving, how important that was. I called it. Also, in, on a more serious note, the freshmen. The expectations were very high for them. Maybe it was a little too much for guys that in their first year in college basketball, but they've been one of the biggest disappointments. Yeah, I, I think there was just too much put on their soldiers, as you just mentioned. You were expecting these guys to come in and be top three options immediately. Sometimes it takes these guys a little longer to prepare themselves for collegiate basketball. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Maryland women's basketball came into this weekend with a 4-4 four and four record in conference play. Brenda Fries and company faced off against Penn State on Sunday, looking to build some momentum and avoid back-to-back -back losses. Let's go to the first quarter where the Terps, Terps look like they're going to keep it close on the road, but a quick 9-0 run from Penn State puts the Nittany Lions up 18-9. Both teams finding their rhythm offensively for an explosive second quarter featuring former Terp Ashley Owusu with some clutch transition buckets for Penn State. After halftime, the Nittany Lions just keep piling it on. A 10-point lead turns into 20, then even 30. It's Penn State with a dominant 112-76 win, and Maryland finds itself with an under 500 record in the Big Ten. Here's head coach Brenda Fries after this one. Uh, we had no answer whether uh, whichever defense we were in, and um, credit to them. I, I thought uh, you know it was probably one of the best games I've seen them play. While it's clear women's basketball has struggled the past couple of games, it was able to put together a convincing win on January 20th for its alumni game. That also happened to be the day it honored Mar a Maryland legend, Tara Heiss. Alexa Wooten spoke with Maryland coaches, players, and alumni about the legacy Heiss built here just over four decades ago. When I hear the name Tara Heiss, uh, I think of just her legacy, all that she's meant to Maryland and, uh, you know, really set the foundation for everything to follow. We went to the first ACC tournament. We went to the first national tournament. We got the first television play all through that team being so good. And she led it. Tara Heiss and the 1978 Terrapins put Maryland on the map. From that point on, Maryland women's basketball was a top program recruits wanted to play for. I know when we heard the, the news that Tara had passed, our staff had uh, felt it was really important that uh, we honored her legacy. This past July, Heist passed away at only 66 years old, a loss truly felt by the Maryland community. To celebrate the legacy she built here, Maryland women's basketball decided to honor her with a number 44 patch. Oh, it made me feel proud. You know, they're carrying a legacy and they do a good job of it. Maryland's always in the fight. I just hope they know who she is. The players now certainly do. I asked Cheyenne Sellers and Riley Nelson how much it means to them to be able to wear a patch for one of the Maryland greats. You know, she won the first AC championship here, well, first Final Four, first thousand point score. So it means a lot just to wear that, to wear that patch, and just to know that we're carrying on her legacy. She um, kind of set the pathway for us to uh, come in and um, set the tone with uh, a dominant point guard for Maryland. So, and obviously, you see, Maryland has a history of getting pretty great point guards. So I think it just means a lot to me. Heist laid the foundation for excellence at Maryland and it has continued year after year. I came here, you know, to be part of a big time program, to be challenged, you know, to be put up against the number one teams in the nation. Um, so I, I think she would be proud of, you know, what we're doing today and just to, to continue that legacy for her. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Alexa Wooten. And Jonas, it's clear that the culture around this women's basketball program, program is so good. And what Tara Heiss was able to do in the 70s is a big reason why. Yeah, it kind of almost shines a spotlight on the recent struggles for the program because as we can tell from what Alexa was saying, it's been good for a really long time. No doubt about that. Now stay right there because when we come back, Kira Bruno takes a deeper look at the culture Michael Loxley has established at the Maryland program. We'll also have highlights from wrestling, gymnastics, and much, much more, all after a short break. Stay with us. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. 
visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. There are so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years, and I got my third child, who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become, and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you. Hey guys, it's me, Isabella Gomez, filling in for Smokey Bear because he's got more to say than just... Only you can prevent wildfires. Like, if you're outside enjoying a barbecue, don't let a hamburger distract you from fire safety. Make sure you aren't dumping your hot coals or ashes onto the ground because that could start a wildfire. So take wildfire prevention seriously and let's save the world one day at a time. Juntos con Smokey Bear, podemos hacerlo. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Welcome back to The Left Bench, brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Jonas Evans with Nathan Schwartz. We've still got plenty of action to cover. Let's start with Maryland Wrestling hosting number one ranked Penn State on Sunday. Yeah, that was a big challenge for Alex Clemson and his squad. When number one Penn State came to town, it was no easy task for Maryland Wrestling. Despite a sold out crowd at the Xfinity Center Pavilion, the upset for the Terps was nowhere in sight. We'll start with Penn State's Braden Davis picking up a major decision at 125 before Maryland's Braxton Brown earned an 8-3 decision at 133. Then it's Ethan Miller adding Maryland's final three points of the match with a decision at 149. After intermission, Jackson Smith was the lone Terp to go the distance, dropping his first dual match of the season to number one Aaron Brooks. And Penn State wins its 51st straight dual match, sweeping the final five weight classes. Here's head coach Alex Clemson after the match on his thoughts entering the intermission only down 14 to six. They capitalized and did what they need to do to win. I would have liked to see both guys push for a major decision. I think, you know, that, that team today did a good job of hunting tech balls and pins. I would like to see my two guys, you know, close out. Number 17, Minnesota hosted number 21, Maryland in a top 25 gymnastics matchup on Saturday. Starting with the bars, Sierra Kondo gets it going with a bang. A 9.85 gives her the top score in that event. Then Madeline Komorowski finishes with an impressive 9.85 on the beam. But on the other side for Minnesota, it was all about consistency. As a team, the Golden Gophers scored higher in every event. It was close, then less close, and by the end of it, Minnesota finished this one with a comfortable 196.725 to 195.625 victory. With the men's lacrosse season only a week away, Inside Lacrosse revealed its preseason media All-American list, and some Terps are on the list. Ajax Zapatello was named to the first team, and Luke Weirman was named to the third team. And in his return from injury, Logan McNaney was named as an honorable mention. Congrats to those three for the preseason acknowledgement. We are so glad to be back bringing you everything you need to know about Maryland athletics, but there was a lot that happened during the break that we couldn't fill you in on. So, here's what we missed. Let's start in Nashville, where Maryland football captured a third consecutive bowl win for the first time in program history, defeating Auburn 31-13 in the TransPerfect Music City Bowl. Sticking with the football program, Coach Loxley went to the transfer portal to find a potential replacement for Talia Tungavailoa. The Terps brought in former NC State QB MJ Morris, who will compete with Billy Edwards Jr. and Cam Edge for the starting spot this fall. On the hardwood, both basketball teams captured big wins. The men took down both UCLA and number 10 Illinois on the road, and the women grabbed home wins over Northwestern and Purdue. And to round things out, wrestling picked up a home dual win against Northwestern, and gymnastics started out its season with two home wins over Westchester and Rutgers. It's not all about taking home a win, but rather community and rebuilding after tragedy. Maryland football was at an all-time low after tragedy struck its team in 2018, Head coach Michael Loxley was brought in to bring them back to better than they were before. Kira Bruno takes a deeper look into how this team has flourished into one fans haven't seen in a long time. When we talk about college sports, we're talking mostly about winning and losing and the grit it takes to take the field. But behind the competition is a driving force at the center of every program. And that is the program's culture. It defines you. And when it shatters, it can break you. That happened to Maryland football. Coming back from defeat seemed impossible until Maryland Athletics found a coach who drew up a play to get Maryland football back in the game. 
Not an easy task, especially after the team suffered a tragedy with the death of Jordan McNair back in 2018. Like I was at the workout, I did the same workout, so it was kind of like, honestly, like eye-opening and like kind of crazy to see like this is what happened, like this is what came from that workout we were all at. What came from that workout was tragedy. The loss of a teammate and for many months after that, struggle. Well, we had a lot of healing to do. Maryland Athletic Director Damon Evans had to find someone who could not only help heal a broken team, but also revive it. But I knew I had to find someone that could accept the challenges that we were dealing with and to help bring our community, our team, and our university through those challenges. That's when he came across Michael Loxley, who he'd been watching from afar at Alabama. And after a few interviews, Evans knew Loxley was right for the job. And Loxley knew it wouldn't be easy. It was probably at one of the lowest points I'd seen it. I, I can't speak for years that I wasn't here, but definitely um, a lot of turmoil, not stabilized. And while there's little in a coach's playbook on how to heal a broken team, there was a lesson from Loxley's personal life that helped. He had just lost his own son who was shot and was managing his children's grief over the loss of their brother. And what he learned? was everyone deals with grief differently. And you can't cookie cutter it. You can't just put a Band-Aid over it and say one size fits all. He held short meetings he called speed dating. And I asked two questions. What do you like about being a Maryland football player? And what things don't you like about being a Maryland football player? That allowed him to build the coach player trust, something his players made clear they needed. It felt like guys were being heard because I feel like that helped a lot. I mean, if you take a look at Locks, he deeply cares about the young men uh, that are on his team. He constantly has them over his house. His wife, Kia, is very involved in their lives. The first shift Locksley saw on his team was in the last game of the 2019 season against Michigan State. And then... Yeah. The arrival of uh, Leah Tungavailoa. Uh, and some other transfers along with the nucleus of players that decided to stay, buy in, and I started to see the growth. On the field, but also off. Like going in that locker room and just knowing that like you're in a safe place, like you kind of can go to anybody and, and feel comfortable enough to, to have a conversation, whether it's a personal, whether it's about the team, about whatever you want to talk about. Like, I feel like having that relationship and having that bond in the locker room and that connection is amazing. That camaraderie helped boost the status of the six-year player. In that locker room, like it's, it's been, it's been tremendous. Like to be a part of it and just see, like as an older guy who came in as that freshman, I kind of just sat back and watched. And, and now I'm up in the front as as a leader. Um, I feel like it's just been amazing. Equally amazing is how this new Trust and team building led to a cultural shift that started showing up on the field and on the scoreboard. Only to be challenged again by expectations from a new coach, a revamped team, and a fan base hungry for even more. Back in the day, people would have been happy with seven or eight games. Now it's, we need to win nine or ten, so we got to get comfortable with the expectations of People want us to compete for championships. And that has been a challenge. Some of the initial momentum with this revamped team seems to have stalled for an increasingly demanding fan base. When you've had challenging times, there's always doubt that creeps in your mind. Um, what I've seen is that doubt eliminated. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that the program is heading in the right direction. I still see a team that's together. I still see a team that has a lot to fight and play for. This isn't the Maryland that 2018 Maryland or that Maryland that went through the things. This is a whole new ball game. I think that's what got the guys to buy in was the fact that we were seeing that change and seeing that he wanted the best for this school and for these players. Um, I think that was the, the biggest thing that helped helped that change come is, is is us noticing as a team and a family that like he cares for us, he cares for this university, and he's trying to change for the better like better of this of this place and this team. It may look impossible to those on the outside for Maryland to get to the next level in college football, but this team has made it clear they will continue to fight and do whatever it takes to get there, just like they once did in 2018 to be where they are now in 2023. I'm Kira Bruno reporting.
Great stuff, Kira. Thanks. And Jonas, when you take a look at how this program has shifted over the last five years with Michael Loxley, it's clear he's made this program for the better. Yeah, and it seems like that first impression he made right when he got to campus was is so integral to the success now because it, it just seemed like he, he took control quickly. He identified who wanted to stay and who wanted to leave, and I think that's really important to what they've been able to do now. And this program continues to climb, and it's going to stay that way as long as Loxley is at the helm. Absolutely. Now stay right there because when we come back, we'll bring on a familiar guest for a new debate segment. And we'll name our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, and Top 5 Plays. Don't go anywhere. Hey world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. Alright, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight, both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. We're not in your hand trying to text somebody back because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Mario uh, fue pintor más de 30 años. Cuando Mario me dijo que tenía problemas en el trabajo, que se le estaban olvidando las cosas, fue difícil. Yo le di a la gente que le diga a su familia lo que está pasando con él. Y quiero que me apoyen, que me entiendan y que me quieran. Jason, let's go see your room. Welcome back, everyone, to the Left Bench, brought to you by Terry Prince Sports Central. Nathan Schwartz and Jonas Evans with you. And Jonas, we're always get down for a good debate, and we're bringing back a familiar face to join this one today. Yup, it's our favorite, Brandon, of course. This segment was bound to happen eventually. It's the Dirty Turtles Trio, which means TSC's editor-in-chief, Brandon Schwartzberg, is joining us. Brandon, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me on. Well, guys, there's a lot to discuss when it comes to Maryland basketball, but let's start with the men's team. We've seen a lot of different versions of Kevin Willard's squad over recent weeks. What version do we expect to see in March, and will that be a team that's playing in the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I think right now the men's team is playing the best it's played all season long. I think they're going strong. They're tied for fifth right now in the Big Ten. The top four teams all get the double bye in the conference tournament, and I think that could be huge for the Terps tournament hopes. But having said that, it is still a long way to go for them to get in. They're on the outside looking in. They're getting better as the season has gone on, but my only problem is it may be too late. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, it's, it, it, the inconsistency has been the number one thing, uh, especially for me. I think that um, offensively, they haven't really been able to secure who their kind of uh, main offensive targets are, and I think that's been one of the biggest issues for them. Yeah, I think if we go back and – see the way they were playing a couple weeks ago. There was just no cohesion, but now this team is playing better than it has all year. You want to be, be playing your best basketball as you go down the stretch. So I think that Kevin Willard is only going to make this team better as the next week, couple weeks go on, and we're going to be seeing a team contend for that double bye in the middle of March and then work their way to maybe a last four in spot in the NCAA tournament. All right, so that was a good first part. Let's go into another Maryland basketball topic, and there's no – secret that Maryland basketball has had a history of phenomenal guards throughout the years. So where does Jameer Young rank among the program's best, Brandon? I think in terms of guards only, he's up there at the top of the list. He's been a better scorer in his Maryland career than Anthony Cowan, Grievous Vasquez, Steve Blake, even Melo Trimble. His impact on this team is insane. His, uh, his point per game total is 29% accounting for this team's total points this season. You talked earlier on the show about how little they've scored in the Big Ten. Jameer Young has done so much of that. But having said that, I still would put him below Melo Trimble on kind of the Maryland all-time point guard list, mainly because Melo Trimble was a three-year starter, led them to three straight tournament teams, especially if Jameer Young can't lead, them, can't lead Maryland to a t tournament this year. I think he's going to have to slap below Trimble. Yeah, I think you've got to keep Steve Blake, Juan Dixon at those top two, the, the impact that those two and just – 
the amount of talent they had on those teams was amazing. I think you could slot Jameer in at that three spot. And just the, and Brandon, what you said, that the sheer impact that Jameer has had on this team, he's been honestly the only reason that this team has had any relevancy over the last month or so. If it wasn't for Jameer Young, we'd be looking at a team with more losses than we'd have wins at this point in the season. So at, at the, for that reason, I think I got to put Jameer at three. Listen, I, I think it's it's easy to point at guys like Melo Tremble, Anthony Cowan, when you have all that uh, success, especially in the postseason. So it's hard when Jameer's had not a really successful Maryland team. I'm going to agree with you, Nate. I'm going to put him up there because he's accounting for a major percentage of their scoring this season. He's the only reason, like you mentioned, they're scoring any points at all. So I think from a pure objective perspective, uh, he's he's done such an excellent job offensively. He's all the way up there. Uh, well, one last one. Let's transition a little quickly to women's basketball. With the way the last few weeks have gone for Maryland women's basketball, it's clear they need to make a big run to appear in the NCAA tournament. If they do that, who will be the X factor for them to find some success down the stretch? Is Diamond Miller hopping on a flight from Minnesota, gaining national year of eligibility and coming to D.C.? Because if not, then I don't think they've got a shot. But if so, it's going to have to be Cheyenne Sellers. She's leading the team in points, rebounds, and assists. She's day-to-day -day with that injury she suffered in Sunday's game. So I think her not just being there, but being as playing as well as she has is going to be so vital for the Terps down the stretch. Yeah, Bree McDaniel has been such a terrific defender. I, Nate, I know you and I were talking off camera about how important she is going to be to defending Caitlin Clark when she comes to town. Um, I think that that's going to be extremely important. The defense is going to have to be clutch for them if they want to win these games. Yeah, I think it comes down to two players. It's either going to be Bree McDaniel, like we talk, talked about, her defense is great, one of the most aggressive players on this Maryland team. But I'm going to go with Jakia Brown-Turner and just take a look at these stats from the last couple of games. She has five straight games with at least 16 points and six rebounds, three straight games with 20-plus points, and she's gone 7 of 12 from three over the last five. So this is a player that had some scoring struggles at the beginning of the season, not to mention she's had postseason success with NC State the past couple of years. I think if Maryland wants that veteran leadership, it's going to come from Jakia Brown-Turner. Well, gentlemen, that's all the basketball we can fit into the show today. Brandon, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm glad it, uh, it went better than the Ravens game did. <laughs> oh, of course, we had yeah, to mention that. That was a rough fumble for Zay at the one-yard line, but I guess you'll get it next year. All right, be sure to check out all of Brandon's coverage on X at bschwartzberg03. He's also got a podcast that's not too bad either. Thanks, Brandon. All right, now it's time to introduce our Turp of the Week, and this week we had to go with the guy who's red hot from beyond the arc, Jahari Long. Long has been on an absolute tear lately. The senior guard went 8 of 10 from three-point land in the last three games, including making 3 of 4 against Nebraska on Saturday. During the week, Long shot 60% from the field and averaged 9 points a game, giving the Terps a much-needed spark off the bench. Long's bigger role in the offense helped Maryland win two crucial conference games, and if he keeps this up, he could make a case for entering the starting five. Congrats to Jahari on being crowned our Terp of the Week. We're staying on the hardwood for our pro Terp this week. Former Terps have been lighting up the NBA all season, but this past week there was no stopping the Thunder's Aaron Wiggins. The third-year shooting guard scored 55 points for his squad last week. That included 13 points and three rebounds against the Trailblazers on Tuesday. And just a day later, his best game of the season. On Wednesday against the Spurs, Wiggins was lights out, going 9 for 11 from the field for 22 points and three rebounds. Oklahoma City sits at the top of the Western Conference as Wiggins continues to make an impact. Congrats to Aaron for being crowned our Pro Turp. All right, Nate, first top five of 2024. Let's get it started. Let's do it. I've been waiting on this one. All right, here we go to the pad for number five. It's Ethan Miller taking down. Look at that twist right to the ground. One of Maryland's few bright spots from that loss on Sunday. We've got a block party in Ann Arbor. It is Ali Kubek and Lavender Briggs denying the Wolverines at the rim. Such great defensive determination there from the Terps in that one. All right, Xfinity Center for number three, Jamie Kaiser Jr. with the steal pass up court to Dante Scott, and boom, slams that one home. A much needed momentum shift for Maryland in a much needed win they got against the Cornhuskers. All right, we know Bree McDaniel for her defense. Look at these handles, putting her defender on skates. Absolutely unbelievable. Goes one and, and, and she's gone. She's on the ground. That is absolutely unbelievable from McDaniel. She's been such a bright spark for them. You know who's been a bright spot for the men? Jameer Young, a game-winning layup with less than two seconds to go in Iowa City last week. We're going to take another look from that angle. 
been carrying this men's team on his back and my number three Maryland guard of all time. He's unbelievable. He's just, a, he's undeniable right the, now. It, superstar might not even be the best way to describe what Jameer Young is playing at right now. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Left Bench. Kier Bruno and Ricky Podgorski will be at the desk next Tuesday to break down the busy week ahead for Maryland Athletics. But before we go, we have an exciting announcement. On top of our usual two shows and game recaps, we will have a new edition. Drum roll, please. Terrapin Sports Central presents Snapshot, where we'll give you a quick preview of the games for that weekend every Friday. Be on the lookout for the first one in the coming weeks. And with that, you can follow along with all of Terrapin Sports Central's coverage on X, Instagram, and online at terrapinsportscentral.com. We'll see you next time.